practical elements of elements of visual effects and colors, and how to how to just bring up your game's emotion and the personality that you want to convey to the players just a little bit. So that's like where I tend to go to. But definitely, uh, there is lots to lot to learn. Yeah, and a lot to look at. And just a quick note there. Thank you, Olka, for the heads up there. There was a little audio issue going on, and hopefully it's fixed now. <laughs> Thanks, chat. Indeed. Right on. So, yeah, I just wanted to point out one more thing is, uh, for me personally, and I know a lot of you guys as well in the chat, polishing can take up to like 50 to 80% of the development time. Definitely. And Definitely. You wouldn't expect that such a thing from making games. Like, 80%? That's like I spent two hours coding, like making the gameplay actually work, and eight hours of however much that is like just building building the polished level up to my standard that I want then I'm satisfied with publishing my hype out there to the world right and I think that's kind of what I was talking about with the with the getting impatient is like it it can take so long Definitely. and but it adds so it adds so much even sometimes it doesn't necessarily feel like it's adding so much but for the for the end player, like all those little things, they add up to a, a more robust experience. You you are so on point. Have you seen Potatoes or All Cost Games? Ah, damn, I le- I'm learning a lot from the community. Actually, like I look at the games made by Hype C- PT Jones, and I'm taking a look at also like games from Nintendo. Like I, lo- I love to look at my favorite games like Zelda and some of the Mario games. How they actually like. Uh, have put so much effort and time focused to making the polish level something that is like bringing the personality of the game really out there. So um, I was thinking of splitting this polishing topic into three parts uh, consisting of visuals, uh, gameplay, and lastly, for the more advanced users out there, the logical logic part of polishing. Because... If we face it, logic can also be polished. Uh, Indeed. So let's jump right so into the a whole first. other can of beans. <laughs> yeah. Well, the worms are waiting for us. <laughs> so stay, stay tuned. Stay, stay tuned for that. So let's jump right into the visual side. Let's look at things. visuals. So, uh, first thing comes to mind from visuals for me is like looking at the game. How coherent is the overall look? of your world that you're building from all the way from the character which is the focal point for many games of mine uh, all the way to the environment collectibles and maybe even the like in all these little details that are flying around you have birds in there maybe if you're in a hailscape you have uh, burning lava all these sounds that are coming from that and particle effects it includes a lot of things but keeping it consistent I think Immersive environment is one key element that you wanna you wanna focus on when polishing in uh, visuals. Uh, even in non-playable areas, I think it's good if you your player is able to explore around. But what's behind those boundaries that you set is also you know, part of the immersive experience. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I think you have to you you definitely want to pay attention to that, but you also kind of have to. Be mindful of like, is anybody going to ever see that? True, <laughs> true. Because I've definitely been in situations where I've been building out a level and I have this nice little detailed area that I'm like really happy with. And then I play the level and I'm like, nobody's ever going to see this. Well, <laughs> for me, even if one player gets to see it, maybe drops a comment about it, that's that's worthy for me. Unless it takes like 30 hours to make, then maybe, <laughs> maybe there's a little balance to be made. But Yeah, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> I guess those that kind of stuff goes to the Easter egg kind of uh, sure. of games. Yeah, the Easter eggs are real fun. I love yeah. building Easter yeah. eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so, why not? If you have time and you have the energy, motivation, and you want to add a little personal touch, Easter eggs can be considered as polishing. Other than other than these kind of like world building things, I personally like to look at color theories and colors. Like I brought a little. Uh, experiment on here on the, the slide if you can see there is my capi planet a hype of mine that i made from the uh, planet remix hype train kind of a thing so i wanted it to inherit the idea of capybara 
because that's my favorite animal. Let's face it, capybaras are awesome. Uh, but I wasn't sure where to like go with that, uh, other than having a capybara there. So looking at the picture on the left, I was pretty satisfied first. Like, okay, so I have this little cute planet with some round trees and this pink uh, globe. But it kind of looked something that uh, something was missing. So I was thinking about consistent colors. Like I went to Adobe Color as an example, and I chose one color and a couple of colors around that. So I went with pink as the planet color, and next to the pink, I can see that there is red and there is orange and this kind of like same kind of colors that very ma- very nicely match together. And I just started like adding those to my scene. And quickly, I started to get this idea that, okay, now my, my game kind of has this aesthetic personality to it. So I really liked that, and I kept going. And uh, that's that's how I like kind of found my way of polishing this specific hype, like focusing on to uh, maybe limiting myself to just a couple of colors as a choice. Kind of like what I did with my Skyliner. Skyliner. I don't know if... Uh, people know, but the Skyliner is this blue skyscape, uh, skyscape uh, parkour game, right? Where everything is just blue. Yeah, yeah. But it stands out. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I actually, I love the way that you work with colors. I find colors really difficult to work with, um, and so I'm jealous of your, your eye for color. Uh, my like <laughs> for color, thank you. Uh, it's humbled, but I'm gonna have to give the thanks and the praise to the Adobe Color <laughs> website. That's that's carrying my bag, little big shoulders and all. Right on. Well, the colors aren't the only thing that actually like finished this game from the visual visual side. Uh, I added these clouds as a little immersive uh, element to the whole planet area. I added some uh, water effects and some kind of steam from the capybara spa that's having up, to, up top, and a little bit smooth animations and into the mix as well. Uh, in general, like when you think about polishing visuals, uh, it can go from acid styles. In uh, As an example, you can have like a sharp edges all in all of your assets consistently. And that, that kind of like makes the visual style already look coherent. If you have rounded bevels, rounded edges in your shapes, uh, if you are organic feel in your game, uh, it's good to keep it consistent. In the polishing stage, if you have ideas of like trying to convey some kind of like emotion, maybe like roundedness can keep some kind of cutesy, comfy emotions, but jacket edges or 45 degrees uh, edges, that can go towards the more of the, like a futuristic sci-fi look. So it's I think it's important to keep most of the things coherent in the same uh, same game. Um, and what comes to uh, that, that kind of like extra bit of details that adds Im- immersion, uh, I would like to think about visual and sound effects, like you described what you had been wor- working on. So everything from simple dust trails when you run and jump uh, all the way to something like sun rays in a forest or maybe rain effects in a forest added with all the necessary sound effects, some rain sound and all of that kind of jazz. Yeah. Sorry, I was just setting up a scene here so I could show people your your capybara in full screen. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, I like to also think about this little, okay, it's a minuscule detail, but smooth animations coming from all the character animations and visuals, but also Things like UI, uh, user interface, especially if you use the user interface mode, you can do some really cool animations with there. Like if you have a chat bubbles, you can fade them in, pop them out. A lot of these kind of little details that can really, really like finish up the whole feel of the, you know, the UI of the game. Right on. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna show a little bit about color theory that uh, is personally my cup of tea. All right. So here is uh, a game, Altos Odyssey, as an example. It's a very, very beautiful game, but they made a limiting choice of just choosing one color from the color wheel and only using shades of that. So everything is just one color. You have darker purple, lighter purple, a little bit mid purple and all of that. And just the result is like strikingly unique. 
Yeah, that looks real nice. Uh, as, a, as a challenge for everybody in the chat, I have making the next game, thinking about polishing. Take a look at other, other color. Choose some colors there that fit your game and clean it yourself. And give it a shot. I think the result is going to be can be pretty nice. Especially it's a smaller game. Well, it's like more contained game. Larger games, it's more difficult to handle. Like, uh, But smaller games, it's a, it's a nice nice try to try and challenge yourself. Yeah, and it looks nice. <laughs> Let's jump into gameplay, gameplay polishing. All right. Uh, for me, it's easy to forget a lot of these kind of parts, but gameplay pol polishing uh, goes maybe even further than the visual polishing side of things. Like, okay, visuals can sell you the game. When, you s when you're swapping into the feed and you see a, ni a, ni a nice-looking game, right, that's the visuals. When you jump right into it, start gaming, then we go to the polishing gameplay kind of a thing. Uh, and here, maybe most importantly, if you take anything out of this polishing gameplay part, is that your game should feel nice, feel good to play. That, I think that's like something that you already mentioned. It's super important. Right. So from the start all the way to the finish, it's satisfying. Indeed. I love these uh, these difficulty curves you have here on this. Right. I, I think that goes kind of hand in hand with the gameplay uh, polish, is that when, yeah. you, when you have a game that you can be played from start to finish and you start like packing things up, it's good to like gameplay. Uh, it's good to test your gameplay. Give it out to some people or even yourself. It's uh, sometimes it's difficult for yourself to see the challenges that the game might have. But other people like just hand it out there. Give it a link, share uh, to your friend, your family, your enemies, and like uh, ask them what was the hard part, or look at them game uh, gaming your play, <laughs> playing your <laughs> game. Yeah, this is uh, this is the first thing that I kind of learned when I started really getting into like level design and building games is that w when you're building something, you're spending a lot of time with it. And hopefully if you're doing it right, you're testing it very frequently. Um, and naturally, you're going to get pretty good at it. And it doesn't take very long before you become a very bad judge of how difficult your game is. Right. So you definitely want to put it in the hands of other people and watch them play it. And you'll be surprised at like how how much trouble people might have where where you didn't see any trouble at all because you just know how to play the game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's easy to accidentally involve these. They say they call this like difficulty spikes. It's really easy to accidentally like put this in your game and you don't see them if you get used to it playing so many times over and over and over. Right. But if you look at, like, your friends gaming, and you see, you kind of, like, start to understand how easy it is to play. Like, maybe a good way to start is to keep it easy and ramp the difficulty up all the way uh, towards the end, whether the climax can be. You can, of course, make it so that you're giving a challenge, you're rewarding all the time, making it a little bit easier, this kind of curse, but it's usually a good idea to start low and end up high. But if in this midway you have an accident like some boss battle that nobody can finish without dying a couple of times, maybe if that is turning people down from playing your game to the end, maybe it can be adjusted to be a little bit easier. So balancing right, this kind of difficult curve, I think, uh, can take a lot of time, can get a little bit social, but hey, it's so easy to just share your hype and let it let all the users play it. And now with the replay feature that we have, the game clips, those can when it, when those are uh, out there for everybody, uh, those can actually be used for you to see how other people. Yeah, that's play. like free play testing on your game. Right, right. <laughs> and I cannot stress it enough. Like play this thing in the gaming industry, a game making industry is like difficult to get to. Like. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, and it's a lot of hassle to like get people to actually play this your game and give feedback or see how they're playing. So we at Hype Hype wanted to make this such an easy feature that you can just see, uh, is it now available in the leaderboard maybe? If you have a game with a leaderboard in it, you can see all the 
uh, you can see a list of all the game clips and just watch the re uh, watch them like replay the game and see where they are touching, where they are having challenges. Right. Maybe adjust the game based on a couple of those. Yeah, and make sure you don't just watch the top of the leaderboards. Go down a little bit. Watch some people in the middle. <laughs> so Wiper is definitely going to be the one that doesn't have much challenges with your hardest types. But right. Yeah, definitely looking at the bottom as well is, is a really good idea. We got a question here from P.T. Jones. Uh, during game jams, how can we maximize the gameplay polishing phase with such limited time and working independently? It can become quite hard to find people to play test your game. And yes, that is definitely true in this type of situation. Um, it's, I would say it's almost a guaranteed in a 48 hour game jam that you are not going to test your game enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the polishing, polishing can take so much time. Like, like said, already we are like, talking about two different, completely different topics about like visual game, uh, gameplay polishing. Right. Both of those are like massive things to actually Yeah, like, yeah. and we still have a third topic we're gonna come to here in a moment. Yeah, talk about that, but hey, a game jam is maybe like the mindset of the game jam is not to make a perfect game, but right. to get something out there according to the theme and join the community of all the game makers out there if you are fine and satisfied with your game, maybe afterwards you can bring the polish into it if you still have the energy and motivation. But maybe that's also maybe the, a little bit of the fun of it. Like you can just sure. experiment really quickly, limit yourself with how much you can do. Like, okay, uh, this uh, goes a little bit more towards like a advanced user stuff. So you kind of have to have experience to understand how much time will this kind of visual style this kind of idea or thematic or this kind of gameplay uh, course, maybe you, you have a parkour level and it's a very long one. How much time actually is going to take to make this whole course into something that you can easily keep track of if this is easy or if this is difficult in these parts. But um, I would love to test your games before the game jam ends. So if you can drop into the Discord server or somewhere in Hype Hype, you can just send me an invi invite to your Hype and I'll gladly play with your Hypes and give you some feedback. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a big advantage we have is the Discord. There's definitely people there that will that'll probably help you out with a little bit of play testing. Um, but yeah, I would, I would overall, the, I have the same kind of idea about this, as particularly this style of game jam, short, short two day jam, essentially. It's really, it's not about making an amazing game. It's about the collaboration, learning together, having fun. Um, and really, if you if you have something at the end that is playable, I think you've succeeded in yeah. the game jam. Yeah. yeah, that's a big W right there. Um, personally, I'm not gonna be able to polish my gameplay at all. No, me neither, mine is, uh, I talked about this a little bit on Friday. Mine is what we call in the industry an MVP. <laughs> it is the minimum viable product. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the way to go in this kind of thing. Yeah, it has yeah. the basic gameplay will be there, and uh, it's not going to look great. It probably could play a little bit better, and uh, I'll continue to work on it after the game jam's over. I do the complete opposite way of working and focus completely on the visuals. <laughs> and now I I can move my player, attack a boss. That's about it. But it looks nice. Nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's also another uh, good argument for working in teams. Right, right. <laughs> so if we were to ever collaborate on a game jam, uh, I think we could end up with an actual product with all these aspects in mind. Someday that's going to be easy with High Pipe. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, but yeah, particularly uh, with High Pipe, so many people working by themselves. Mm. Uh, yeah, would don't get stressed out if your game's not like super well polished. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right on. If you take something out of this uh, thing that we are having here as a panel, uh, I would like to suggest trying to focus on making the gameplay just feel good and not that punishing for especially newcomers that are trying the game. So right. it's it usually if you are satisfied with your challenging gameplay, bringing up bring it down just one level can be enough to make it something that's more accessible for uh, less less like pro gamers. Right. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult topic, so, so little time. 
so much to do. For sure. Definitely. And PT says, thanks. Thanks to both of us for the input. <laughs> right on. Thanks, chat. And, and Hypesy says he's working feverishly. <laughs> we have two hours, right? You have got like two and a half hours, Hypesy. Come on. Got extra 30 minutes in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep it up. You can, you can do it. Indeed. Can't wait to see what you guys have been working on, chat. Okay. Right. I think there was there was one we kind of got sidetracked there a little bit, but when we were talking about difficulty curves and in particular difficulty spikes, mm -hmm. I think you kind of touched on it a little bit. But if you have a big difficulty spike in your game, it becomes significantly more likely that players are just gonna stop. Yeah. They're not gonna try and finish your game. They're gonna they're gonna try it a couple of times and be like, this is this is easy, and then all of a sudden it's like impossible. Next swipe. <laughs> that's the that's the hard part of high pipe. It's kind of unforgiving as a platform because if you fail at this and your your players drop out, like they can just swipe so quickly away. So getting them invested into the game from early on with easy easy stuff, easy controls, easy to pick up, give them rewards, like give them small challenges and always reward them. Uh, you don't need to as like. Okay, as a game maker myself, I don't want to give freebies away all the time. But maybe I should actually sometimes do that. Maybe some different kind of freebies. There's score, health, other collectibles, like Mario games do a lot of these like little things that you can collect. And giving those, even if they don't have that much significant impact, uh, it, it's fun to get and collect things. So even from like small challenges, it's nice to like direct the player to do the right thing and get attracted to, hey, okay, so if I finish this jump or if I defeat this boss right here, there is this big pile of gold or candy or whatever uh, waiting for me. Maybe a friend waving it there in a trap in a prison. Something That's another thing. I, I don't want to go too off on like kind of specific advice, but one thing I really like to do in my games, I try and do it, particularly if I have something that's a little more open, like I have a 3D world, people can move around. I want as quickly as possible for the player to see what their end goal is. So like I might have, I've actually done this a couple of times in high pipe. So the position where you start straight ahead of you, you can see the finish, but you can't get to it. You gotta right. go explore the level, find your way around, maybe unlock some paths and then you can get there. But right away, you know what it is that you're supposed to do. I think you're you're really good at putting that out there because that has a so such a big impact on the like psychological level of thinking. Like you have a goal, you already learn it. So now you it's just a question of like how do I get there? It's like Breath of the Wild. If Chat has ever played like these Zelda games, the Breath of the Wild, when you get out of the first cave, you see the end goal right there. But oh boy. Is the long way you got a whole there. game in front of it <laughs> although you can already go in, yeah that's a whole different topic for another day but uh this this kind of like mindset of how designing games uh on the psychological level of like introducing the goal already right when the game begins or just a couple of seconds after that it can have a significant impact. I, right. should, I should try to in, incorporate this into my game. I think even if it's not the end goal, like having those carrots there always, always having something there that the player's like, oh, I need to, I need to do that. I need to go over there. Maybe even, th maybe there's not even anything interesting there or like anything worthwhile there. It just looks like a cool place. Player's like, I want to go over there. <laughs> right, it's a point of interest. Right. I do hate myself when I get lost in a game. I'm blaming myself like, ah, oh, I'm such a bad player. I got lost. I don't know what to do. There is no clear goal uh, objective for me to go to, especially in adventure games. Right. Like, I tend to get lost a lot because I like to explore all the nook and the crannies right. out there. Uh, but yeah, like having that goal in mind already, like can get me right back to the track really. Yeah, easy. exactly. Because it can be definitely really frustrating in those types of games where right. you where you end up somewhere and you're just like, I don't know where I'm supposed to, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And, uh, <laughs> and you're just like running around aimlessly for a while. It's okay if your uh, game jam game has a little bit of exploration. For sure. <laughs> That's so, that got me a lot of work to work to get to, but just keeping it in mind for future games and designing levels, I think.
that's a, that's a nice touch. Uh, PT is saying here, uh, also, I think working on a multiplayer project during a short game jam might not have been the best of ideas. Okay, so you're a person <laughs> that likes to challenge themselves, right? Uh, multiplayer games, they can be epic, and they can be epically difficult, especially because the tech is still new, even for us. And yeah, it's evolving. It's evolving. But hey, best of luck to you. You can do it. Indeed. We have faith in you, PT. It's okay if it's a little buggy or if it doesn't have that much control. I think in general, like multiplayer games, talking about high pipe multiplayer games, just having the option of getting your friend to come over to your game, even if that doesn't have a clear goal, you can just like have fun, goof around, explore together, however it is, chat maybe a little bit, draw some emotes. Like that's already like fun for me. So it it does add a little bit of boost of like uh, fun and satisfaction to your game if you're able to have this aspect already in there. Multiplayers do bring that nice a- social aspect of it. Right. And of course, we do aim to make it as easy as possible. But like you said, the tools are still new. Um, I didn't try and make a multi. I, st- I even, on my regular projects, I've only done a couple of multiplayer. I haven't released any yet. Because really? it's, it's pretty difficult to work with. And... Uh, uh, to do all the things that you might want to do, it, it might not even be possible yet because the because the state the tools are in at the moment. Right, right, yeah, yeah, that's so true. Um, we there, it is really good that people are trying to make multiplayer games. We are learning a lot. We are looking at all of the games that are published as multiplayer games, and we are looking at those. What are the issues? How can we make it easier, better, and just like more available for everybody to make great multiplayer games. This this is maybe one reason why I went ahead and published a super, super simple uh, template of a multiplayer game where it's like the Vibe Hub, but with everything they can add. Right. So just the, like four players can join in and start, That's cool. start hanging out. Yeah, I think the, the most complete, I haven't released it, it's in my unlisted, but I did a remix of the Fall Boys. Oh. That's, uh, nice. that's <laughs> the only multiplayer game that I've actually finished. Uh, and I still didn't put it out. I don't know why I didn't release that, but we'll see. Okay, can't wait to see that. <laughs> Shogun Touch of Fall Boys. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, we touched a little bit about it, but uh, keeping going back to the gameplay polish, I think it's really good if you can keep uh, rules and the mechanics on on top of the objectives and all of these gameplay feel and contrast that we talked about. Rules and uh, mechanics of the game uh, is something that it's really difficult to sometimes realize that, oh, damn, uh, your game's rules change. Suddenly, some games do these tricks of changing. Okay, so now you have uh, this kind of different rule that now you're trying to apply to your game. Sometimes uh, hypes can be kind of like messy in that regard. So enemies work this way, and suddenly enemies work that way. And now, as a player, you get confused sometimes. And uh, keeping that consistent so that enemies of this kind are the same. Now, if your zombie suddenly is able to do completely different mechanics to your player and challenge them in a way that they didn't expect, uh, that maybe you'll want to change the zombie into something that represents that new rule right. somehow. And if you have new rules, uh, it goes hand in hand with the difficulty curve so that uh, new rules are introduced progressively right. throughout the game. So uh, Zelda games, I think, like to do this, that they have a new enemy type, like a really difficult enemy type as a boss. And when you complete the boss and you progress in the game, that kind of boss type becomes a normal enemy because you learned it and now you're able to master your gameplay around it. So now it's just like out there along with other enemies. But First, it felt like a boss because it was new. Right. Progressively introducing new things. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the, that's the key is when you are going to add a, something, some sort of change to the game rules or to how things are functioning, yeah. you definitely you want to introduce it somehow. You don't want to just drop it in. You know, like you want to draw attention to it. True. And true. be like, this is, this is a new enemy and it's going to do some new stuff and now you need to learn it and, so that you can fight it. <laughs> hey, wow, that's epic. Like, look at this. Uh, yeah. You know, and that could be, you know, a nice little cinematic before you fight, you know, like maybe just zoom in on the guy and it's like, bah, new enemy. And 
Yeah, uh, I like that. I like that. Or, or it could be, you know, as simple as you said, it just looks different. It's the enemy you haven't seen before. So you know right away that it's going to be different. It's just maybe the amount of uh, polish your game needs. Like if it's constantly having cinematics to introduce new things, like a new coin, new pickup, new enemy all the time, like cinematics, maybe that gets a little bit overwhelming. So know your limits, know your game, know the personality of your game. And just like match these things to that. You'll you'll get there. Just be one with the game. <laughs> as cringe as it sounds. It's true. Sure. <laughs> Should we talk about the logic a little bit? Uh, polishing logic. Let's talk about polishing logic. Right. Uh, this doesn't sound like an important thing all that much. And for sure, uh, often in programming, it, it isn't. If you are releasing a game, who cares if your code is not commented? Or your code is not isn't being able to understand by anyone except you as a game studio or big games. Even AAA, AAA games are doing this so that they get the game out there and no, maybe they don't need to care. But yeah. in high pipe, it's a very unique thing that even anyone can remix your game, so they can get a peek under the hood and see how it's all done there. And high pipe is so unique in this regard that uh, remixing. Is actually super cool. Uh, it helps you a lot to build a fan base around your games. Like uh, I have, I have seen quite a lot of remixes from my hypes, and people are coming back to my profile because of that. And I get metrics and all, all, all go and all of these kind of uh, things towards that. So. Yeah, I think it's also just worth mentioning here because, uh, you know, of, of course, our algorithm is like everything else, still very much in development. But right. the remixing is like a positive signal, a very strong positive signal for your hype to get spread further into uh, to more people, you know, through the algorithm. Uh, so making your thing easy to remix, uh, interesting enough that people want to remix is definitely just as good as making it something that people want to play over and over again. Yeah, exactly. Like if you if we take a look at the screenshots that I have somewhere around here. I don't know. I'm pointing into every direction because it can't be there. It's uh, so that here. Uh, for me, it's this way. For you, it's that way. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, this is a screenshot of my early hype. Uh, it's a no spaghetti. Like, damn, I need some pasta with this. Uh, you cannot read anything of that hype. And that's how I did my first games. What uh, hype no is that? Uh, it's this thing called Bulleteer. I unlisted it oh. because it, I was too ashamed of, ashamed of it, but it's a really old one, one of my first ones, Bulleteer. So I'm kind of like a bullet hell kind of a theme. And looking at uh, a different example here is uh, one of a template that I made. Uh, I introduced a lot of notes in there. Uh, it, most of the things are commented, so anyone that comes and reads the logic or just wants to build the level. You have all the kind of reusables, add-ons, and notes on how to work with this template so that anyone of any skill level could get somewhere with the hype. They doesn't they don't feel lost. And for me, my my game is being remixed into some cool concepts, cool new levels, cool new gameplays, completely different games. And that's a really nice thing. Uh, often it is difficult to think that this is an important thing to actually like spend time on because it's just like inside the game, uh, inside the editor. But it, it has a like it has its play, place. Maybe during global game jam, I wouldn't play pay too much attention to this because this goes to the remixing a part of things. If you want to get your game out there, uh, you can wait until you have released the game for this part. And maybe think about it afterwards. But yeah, it is a little bit of an advanced user feature to be able to understand logic and make things into reusables. We have tons of uh, tutorials and video how tos how you can actually make reusables and at these nodes. So if you want to get uh, into this more, uh, I think we have more about that in HiPi Wiki, and we are constantly updating that. So take a look for take. Uh, look at those kind of yes. kind of features. Let's go open up this 
template to show this to the. So this, uh, you guys, I just showed the bullet here, spaghetti. And now this is the, the other one in the screenshot there, the platformer 2.0. Uh, we can see here we have nice, nice list of instructions and the rest of the hype, super clean. Uh, even when we turn logic mode on there, it only adds a little bit. We don't have nodes and lines going everywhere. So I think this is this is a great example of what you're talking about here. Nice. I like to hear that. And I would like to see more of these introduced to my own games as well. Like I'm going to go update my old games to be more readable, remixable. Uh, that's nice. And I've seen a lot of community also start learning how to do this to them, their own hives. And it has produced a lot of nice, unique new hives. Yeah, actually, uh, I want to give a shout out to Olka, who did the the Christmas card template. Oh, right. And uh, I was doing some notes like this, and I was really struggling with uh, sometimes like where to place the notes. Because sometimes, depending on the camera angle of your hype, it might be really tight, and there's like nowhere to put those notes so that the player sees them as soon as they open it up. And Olka did this trick where he added basically a custom editor camera that's wider uh, so that when you go into the editor, oh, you yeah. have this wide view and you can see all the notes. But when you play, it like immediately disables that camera and gives you the game camera. Uh, and I thought that was a really clever trick. And I'm going to go back on some of the templates that I put notes on and use it. Man, that is genius. <laughs> that is genius. Yeah. That helps a lot. Because if you have these like really tight FOE field of view games, and you want the uh, editor experience to be actually nice, this can make the difference actually. Indeed. Logic polishing can also be something about performance. Any notes on thoughts on that? Well, like, what do you think performance maybe can be uh, polished in hypes? Um, I think it's definitely something you want to be conscious of. Um, and it's kind of really difficult, especially if you're, if you know you're solo dev, you maybe you only have like one device, two devices that you can test on. Um, so that's like one area where like getting some help, finding some other people to play your game, really important. Um, and I guess for me, when I, when I am running into performance issues, the first thing I'm looking at is dynamic physics. Dynamic <laughs> physics, yeah. Like my Skylarner game was more heavy than I thought because I had so many dynamic physics things going on in there, like hundreds of objects already. Like you can push them because I wanted that, but they were dynamic. So when you launch the game, you, you get an FPS spike right away. <laughs> and that's not that's not good. That's not healthy. Nobody right. likes FPS spikes. How I, how I avoided this was uh, enabling to start sleeping on those dynamic objects that you don't need to interact instantly with. Right. And boy, that boosted my perform performance of the hype's uh, optimization really, really nicely. Right. So just a recap. As a quick tip, uh, go to your object's physical properties. If it's a dynamic object, you can enable start sleeping, right? Yeah. It's something like that's called start sleeping. Yeah. So that only when you interact with the object, it becomes like, actively dynamic it wakes up from the sleep right so yeah unless you need the object to move right away in which case you don't want to do that right but, right but yeah if the object is going to start static and then later be affected by something and move you definitely want that start sleeping and this is something we've kind of talked about a few different times uh because people ask about it but i think it, it doesn't hurt to repeat it uh essentially the way the physics work in high pipe is if a object has dynamic physics, right? It can move around, it can do whatever it wants. But if it stops moving, it will go to sleep, at which point it essentially no longer has physical properties uh, outside of like the collision model. And then when it comes into contact with something else, it could be a force, it could be another dynamic object, then it wakes back up and it can do all the dynamic physics again. Uh, so that's what we're talking about when we say start sleeping. Um, and then you also have some sliders in there. You can adjust the sleep threshold. So like how quickly the object will go to sleep when it kind of stops moving. Uh, so those are two things that you can play around with. Nice. It does go into more advanced things. 
definitely the, the start sleeping slider. I wouldn't mess with it too much unless you're, you have like a really specific scenario where it seems like it might improve things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> indeed. But if you, even for like, if your game starts to get out of hand with size, it has a lot of stuff. It's good to like take a look or two at the physical properties and see if you can improve with a little bit of things. Right. Especially if you cannot test on lower end devices, maybe some uh, older Android devices, especially or these kind of maybe even a web browser, it, it can play differently. And that goes hand in hand with testing your game uh, even on the same device that you have, but first on portrait, then on landscape. And that might, the gameplay might change so drastically that you want to keep an eye out that it's playable on any kind of resolution or right. aspect ratio. Yeah, that's an, that's another kind of fun thing, somewhat unique to Hype Hype, you know, unless you're just a mobile game developer in general. But like when you're making a game on high pipe, there's so many different devices, so many different screen sizes that your player could potentially have that uh, that you really got to think about that. You know, like I think a lot of people, myself included, often are just like, this is a portrait game. It looks good on my phone. It looks good on my iPad. It's good, but it might not be. <laughs> In there on that, boy, do I have a lot of games that are not optimized for, for example, landscape, but... I love to see it when people actually pay attention and make their UI of the game, like in looking Smash 3 template, the UI actually changes drastically when you go into the landscape. And this is achieved with, I think, a node called device info. You can get port is portrait, is landscape, is desktop outputs and change your gameplay a, a little bit. Maybe the UI right. actually. I think you can even get the, the actual screen dimensions through that device info. Right, right. That's that's something that you might want to keep an eye out for. But yeah, these kind of things make your game more remixable in, in the long term, especially. Uh, like play this thing, my, my games have a lot of bugs. Sometimes I don't see those bugs until I gave, give my phone to Shogun or Job or right. uh, all the friends out there. Uh, I swear I have friends uh, and I see that they are they are figuring out these kind of bugs or something or things are frustrating and like we discussed with the difficulty. Right, curve. exactly. It, yeah. It's it's really important that I nail out those pesky bugs so that the experience for all players out there is it feels good and it's nice. Indeed, it's it's a difficult topic when you think about like polishing bugs, but it like. In high pipe, even with us as a dev team, we tend to focus on bugs maybe seventy percent of the time, like nailing out those little bugs on the platform. Same goes with any kind of devs, like the QA, uh, quality assurance, as you will, can can be kind of hefty, even in triple A games. Right. Yeah, I feel for particularly triple A quality assurance people, testers. Because you could have you could have an army of testers, and you release a triple A game, it gets you know played by a million people on the first day. In like the first hour of your game being out, it's been played hours and hours and hours more time than your army of testers could have ever tried to play it. Right, right, and we we, we saw that with <laughs> Cyberpunk and these kind of right. There's all the time you see that a big game comes out and uh, and all of a sudden they're finding lots of bugs they probably didn't know about because even they're like. 100, 200 testers working eight hours a day or more. <laughs> yeah, and when you think about that, that's a, like high pipe dev. Me, a little boy in some room, and trying, I'm looking at people commenting about their bugs, and I'm trying to sleep, but damn, those bugs need to be fixed so my players can be happy. And I do want that. It's difficult to find them yourself. Yeah. Especially because, like you said, you're kind of blinded to your own gameplay. So you Definitely. play your game Correct. You play it right because you know how it's supposed to be played. Yeah. Exactly the same as the difficulty. Like you become a very bad person to to find the bugs in your own game. You can become a very bad person. Shogun <laughs> said that. Uh, so like you can study your own games by playing a lot. But yeah, maybe maybe you can also like I tend to play a lot of games and look at look at games in a different manner. But as a kid, I just used to enjoy games, like play from start to finish, enjoy the, enjoy the story. As a, 
more experienced game developer or maker in Hype Pipe, I've started to look at games like uh, that I play and collect notes on like, hey, this is a nice puzzle idea. Oh, this looks really nice. How could I make this into Hype Pipe? Kind of like a thing. So going out to the next slide that I have here is I recommend do the polishing part. This is something that you can passively do all the time when you play games. It's by study the games that you play. Maybe take notes. This game had really nice polish on the animation, visual effects, uh, sound effects. Some games really, really nail their sound design. And I do learn from that. Personally, I like to overlap multiple sounds in high pipe to make something completely new that nobody has ever done with sounds, for example. And Nintendo games are really good at polishing their Nintendo brand games have a high standard of polish that all of the games need to have. And it shows. That's why they are so high quality. But you can find really, really nice ideas, some elements to incorporate your game or just like learn by playing. Yeah, very good. Very good advice there. And I think that that is a piece of advice that extends to sort of like any creative medium. Whether you're making music, you're, you want to make movies, you want to write books, you want to draw comic books, like you're going to learn so much just by actually paying attention to the media that you consume. That's why <laughs> I suppose like the best game developers are the passionate gamers themselves. Going same to the movie industry, it's the same right there, Right, I think. So, yeah. It's a hobby of sorts that just evolves into this kind of like uh, creation format that you are building. Like it, it's much deeper than it looks. Yeah, definitely. Okay, is was that the last slide? If I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, I would open like to it up to if questions. If, if chat has any questions or comments or maybe some tips that they are looking for or maybe brag about their new hypes that they're gonna be releasing, drop down. Indeed. Down in the chat, please. While we wait for the chat to, to see if they have any questions, there was a question from PT Jones in my last <laughs> session that I did not know the answer to about performance polishing. Right, right. Uh, so he wanted to know if destroying a lot of objects at the same time would be a performance issue. Well, definitely it has an impact. Destroying something can include more than just the one object need to be destroyed. They can have lots of logic that is active at that time. They can have a lot of physics glued to them. Like you have an, you have a, like some kind of slime with some horns, weapons. I don't know. All of these are physical. They have their own properties uh, in the world. Collisions, all the things that are triggering at every every frame. So it, it destroying a lot of these things instantly at the same time uh, can be heavy. Just like spawning things instantly can be. But I'm not sure if there is like completely uh, a perfect solution that you can, as a creator, do anything about that, especially the destroying part. I think it tends to go to platform issues. But what I like to do is if I'm destroying something, maybe sometimes if it's heavy thing causing heavy issues, I hide them and destroy them little by little. But I first like remove them from the game by hiding them, uh, disable their logic, uh, make them invisible, and later destroy them actually. Uh, so that if if there is a problem like an FPS spike or some kind of issues that you are having with destroying hundreds of objects at the same time, you can kind of like buffer it. E even going one step forward, which might not be the best idea, but some I have seen some people also add those into a destroying list. So you have a list of buffering things, and like let's say every one millisecond or ten milliseconds, you go through the list and destroy one by one progressively. Every time that like the kind of trash bin list is filled. Right. I mean that's something that I I've, I've seen being done and might work, but it's more like a thing that we want to polish for the editor side of things so that you creators don't, shouldn't need to worry about these kind of performance issues too much. We we'll want to make the experience for game creators as easy and effortless, especially in these kind of hidden how to understand 
the principles of how this uh, logic execution orders and frames are working with. So right. I hope uh, I hope you are able to like figure something out. And if if not, uh, just hit me up on Discord and we can discuss. Maybe I can ask some devs if they have any pro tips. That would be cool. Yeah, I think some some big brain poly, uh, performance tips. I think always appreciated, especially by the the creators that really kind of try and push push the editor. Yeah, yeah, and I I think our chat is filled with those kind of people. Epic creators. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Any more questions? Um I am not seeing any more questions about this uh about this topic. And we've actually kind of gone over the the planned duration here about ten minutes. So I think we're probably gonna wrap it up here, uh unless somebody asks a question while I am talking right now. <laughs> um so the next official session is going to be in an hour and a half, and that is the official countdown, the last half an hour of the game jam. But I think that I am going to come here and just do a little bit of live editing while I work on my own game so we can hang out and chat about creating games and uh, and finish our games together. But for right now, we are going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for coming and checking out this session. Thank you for the questions, those of you that gave some questions. And uh, good luck polishing and finishing your games. And like... Just remember, like we said, this is a short game jam. Don't stress about it too much. If it's not a perfectly polished game, uh, it's no problem at all. <laughs> yeah, indeed, definitely. Uh, just stay motivated, drink water, and you'll get it out there. There and you go. I want to play your games. So Solid words of advice. So share them, and let's let's see how, how it goes. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Indeed. Thank you. We'll see you in the next session.